Welcome to Social Elo Ministries, where we are committed to glorifying God and exposing the devil. When people say, I decree and declare, do they, or even you, do you know what they're talking about? When they say, I decree and declare. Because a part of making that statement is that those words are so similar that it's almost redundant. And it's not necessary. If you're going to make a declaration, you just say it. And I'm just going to look at um, the definition of those terms to make the distinction, to help us use the correct terms when making a decree and or a declaration. And also what's the meaning behind those things. For example, according to Miriam Webster, a decree, when used as a noun, is an order usually having the force of law. An order usually having the force of law. For example, a judicial decree. Another example is a judicial decision of the Roman Empire. Or we could even say, since this is biblical terms, a judicial decision of the Lord our God. As a verb, to command or enjoin, by or as if, by decree, to determine or order judicially. Some synonyms for decree regarding a noun, a dictate, directive, edict, injunction, order. Some synonyms for verbs, for the verb form, a mandate, dictate, order. And examples, um, or an example when used, well, let me give two examples when used in a sentence as a noun. The president issued a decree making the day a national holiday, or their marriage was annulled by judicial decree. So one of the things we can ascertain from that is oftentimes a decree is something that is written. Now using the same source, let's look at the word declare. When used as a transitive verb, to make known formally, officially, or explicitly. Other example, to make evident, to state emphatically, to make a full statement. Some synonyms for um, declare, proclaim, publicize, publish, sound, release, trumpet, announce. Examples of declare in a sentence. The government has just issued a state of emergency. Or, he openly declared his love for her. So he stated, to decree something is like a royal edict, oftentimes something that's written. To declare is oftentimes an oral proclamation. So when we use the term, I decree and declare, what, and I'm going to say we, what are we really saying if we're saying, I decree and I declare? Because by saying that, you're saying that you are making the decree. And I'll just say, you may or may not have the authority from the Lord to make the decree you're speaking of. You can declare what the Lord tells you. I've also done a message about how, I know there's also a meme, how some people decree and declare, but it doesn't go anywhere. And sometimes the reason why it doesn't go anywhere is that we're saying things from our own flesh, our own desires, as opposed to giving the word of the Lord. The Lord is not obligated 
to fulfill our words or our desires, but he's obligated to fulfill his words. In fact, um, the Lord told Jonah to go to Nineveh and prophesy against the city, preach against them. When Jonah went to Nineveh, he didn't say, thus saith the Lord. He simply said, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. He made that declaration and they knew it came from the Lord. So it was the Lord who decreed it and Jonah declared it. And the people discerned it even though he didn't use the name of the Lord. And Jonah didn't go there and say, I decree and declare that in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed. He simply declared the word of the Lord. Now let's dive into scriptures a little bit. Because it was actually um, Psalm 2 verse 7 that the Lord used to point this out to me that I'm teaching about. In Psalm 2 verse 7 it states, I will declare the decree. I say again, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. I'll say it again. I will declare the decree. So that's how we're supposed to use it, if anything. I declare the decree. But it's not even necessary to say that. Again, just state what the Lord tells you. So again, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath done, had said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. So again, it's not necessary to say, I decree and declare. It may sound, well, it's basically just wordy, a lot of words put together. It may sound powerful, it may sound impactful, but using all those words doesn't make more impact. When the devil tried tempting Jesus, the Lord just decreed, or correction, declared the word of God to him. It is written. Boom. It is written. Boom. And the written is basically the decree from the Lord. And Jesus declared it. He stated it. So again, I read Psalm 2 verse 7 one more time. And before I actually read it, after seeing this, one of the things I did was a word search in the Bible to see if it says anywhere about I decree and declare. This is the closest. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Some other ex examples of decree and declare. For example, Esther. Esther 4, verse 8, and it states, Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree. So the decree was in writing. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them. Now, a king could have made an oral decree and not to cause confusion a oral an oral decree and a scribe would write the decree down and publicize it throughout the kingdom so again also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at shushan to destroy them to show it unto esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him to make the request before him for the people. I summarize the first part. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree. Now, part of this um, decree and declare thing comes from Job chapter 22, when one of um, Job's friends, Eliphaz, the Temanite. Eliphaz the Temanite in Job 22 verse 28 he stated thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee 
and the light shall shine upon thy ways. And many people add to this, the scripture is speaking about um, death and life, or the power of death and life lies in the tongue, and almost, almost as if what we say is going to come to pass. That's not how it works. We can declare the word of God, things he has in the Bible, but even those things don't necessarily apply to us for the situation that we're in. For example, in Joel 2.25, the Lord said he would restore all the years that the locusts had eaten. I make that declaration at times, not simply because it's in Joel 2.25, but because those were words the Lord personally spoke to me, I think it was in 2017. And I can decree those, or I can declare those words because it's something the Lord has personally decreed to me. So it applies to me. And that word has not been fulfilled yet. So I can keep on declaring it. I can keep on declaring it. Not because, in a sense, I'm naming and claiming a scripture. I'm just grabbing a scripture and just, quote unquote, declaring it and thinking it's going to come to pass. Things don't work like that. At least not how we typically um, use it. For example, with Psalm 23, we can read those words and they do apply to us. For example, the Lord is my shepherd. And in saying those things, it builds our faith to know that the Lord is our shepherd. And whether he's leading, leading us in still pastures or by quiet waters, or green pastures or um, still waters, or going through the valley of the shadow of death, we know that he's with us. Because they also say that he will not leave or forsake us. So we can do it at certain times, but we have to be careful how we're making decorations. That we're not misappropriating scriptures. So again, Eliphaz the Temanite, in Job 22, he said in verse 28, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee and the light shall shine upon thy ways. One of the things about um, Eliphaz the Temanite and Job's other friends, we also have to pay attention to what the Lord said about those men. In Job 42, start in verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words, Unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right. And as my servant Job hath. So we have to pay attention to the things that Eliphaz and those other friends said. And that they're truly in accordance with the Lord's will. Like they um, fell into assumption by thinking that Job did something wrong while he was going through his affliction. When the Lord clearly let us know that Job went through those, those afflictions because he was a righteous man. <laughs> and as the saying goes, the Lord could trust Job with trouble. He allowed the enemy to afflict Job because he knew Job would not deny the Lord, his God. And it continues, therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namanite, Namathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. And the Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. 
And this is where people use the saying about double for your trouble. So like what I mentioned earlier about the Lord having given me a revelation regarding Joel 2.25 about restoring all the years the locust has eaten. I've seen some of the stuff the locust has eaten and I understand what the Lord is speaking about. I can say that scripture not simply because it's in the Bible, but it's something the Lord has spoken to me personally about. That means he's given me that word and he must bring it to pass. And I can even, I can even declare that, that he must bring it to pass. And a part of him must bring it to pass, that declaration, also ties into Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 11, when he speaks about his words. And his words will accomplish what he has purposed. Now, making these declarations, we also have to be careful because it ties into um, 2 Peter 1, verse 21, where it states, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And a part of the reason why sometimes people dec decree and declare and doesn't go anywhere is that they're doing so based on their own flesh. They may be quoting scriptures, but they may be doing so based on their own flesh. In Luke 4, 1 through 13, when the devil was trying to tempt Jesus, at one point he quoted scriptures. He quoted from Psalm 91. But he was doing so, of course, of the wrong spirit. <laughs> and what the devil said to Jesus was about um, the Lord giving his angels charge over him so that his feet would not even dash against a stone. But in Psalm 91, the Lord didn't say, I will give my angels charge over thee. It wasn't a direct word from the Lord. Now, it was under the divine inspiration of the Lord. But the Lord didn't say, I will give my angel charge over thee so that these things will happen. Because there's sometimes things do come near our dwelling. We do get hurt. Because if the Lord gave his angel so that nothing would happen to us, we wouldn't even have so much as a scratch on us throughout this entire life. And that's how sometimes we can miss appropriate scriptures. So again, this I decree and declare things because when you say I decree you almost put yourself in the place of God I decree and declare so it's like you're making up your own rules and then you're sitting them and more than likely it's not going to have the Lord's backing so again 2nd Peter 1 verse 21 for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In a part of prophetic ministry, we have to be careful that we're not prophesying from our flesh, that the Holy Spirit is truly leading us to prophesy. We also have to be careful that we're not prophesying based on another spirit. In 1 Samuel 19, Saul had been afflicted by an evil spirit. I think it's in verse 18 where it says that and the evil spirit of the Lord had afflicted him and about Saul prophesying. So Saul was actually prophesying under the unction of an evil spirit. And later in, um, towards the end of 1 Samuel 19, we see how Saul went amongst the prophets and he started prophesying. But at that point in time, he was prophesying under the unction of the Holy Spirit. So you have to be careful about how we are quote unquote prophesying. And we have to be very careful about I decree and declare. And not just uh, the grammatical or the theological aspects of those things. We have to be careful about we're not basically sitting up ourselves as being gods. And as a practical, practical example, sometimes we're trying to speak life into things, but it's not the Lord's will for those things to live. And a great example is Isaiah, not Isaiah, but um, Ezekiel 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones. 
let's take a look at some things that shows that prophecy, like first Second Peter one twenty one, that this was not based on the will of man, but Ezekiel was speaking because the Lord commanded him to speak. It's also nothing about prophetic ministry. It's not just about people speaking because they are a prophet or they're prophetic. It's because the Lord is commanding the person to speak. There are things the Lord will reveal and he may not give that prophet or the person with prophetic gift the authority to release that message. And some people have it wrong where as soon as they get a revelation they start proclaiming it. That may not be the Lord's will. In Genesis 18, when the Lord told um, Abraham about the planned destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham didn't run to the city and, or cities and start making proclamations. He actually interceded to the Lord. In Exodus 32, we see our Lord was contemplating destroying the Israelites who were worshipping the golden idol. Moses didn't go down and say, oh, thus said the Lord, that his anger is waxed hot and he's going to destroy. No, he interceded. In Jeremiah 27, at one point the Lord stated, If they be prophets and the word of the Lord be in them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts. So a lot of times a person receives a revelation and the first course of action is to pray. Ask the Lord if there is any additional information, if he wants you to release the information or if he simply just wants you to hold on to it. There are some things you may have to wait for years before releasing. We also have to be careful about not becoming competitive in prophetic ministry, where we want to be the first ones to release something or want to get credit as if we're the only ones who knew it. In Second Kings verse one or Second Kings um, chapter one, correct in Second Kings chapter two, we see how um, it was time for Elijah to get taken up into heaven. Elijah and Elisha went to different cities. And when they went to the company of prophets, the company of prophets knew that it was going to be Elijah's last day on earth. So Elijah wasn't the only one who knew. Elisha wasn't the only one who knew. Others knew also. So we have to be careful about not getting competitive because we can release things out of timing even if it's from the Lord. In Jeremiah 1, when the Lord commissioned Jeremiah, I'm kind of going off track, but when the Lord commissioned Jeremiah, he told him to speak what sir, he commanded him to speak. And that's a lot of times what gets, I'll say, us into trouble, is that we receive a revelation from the Lord. It is truly from him, but we release it too soon. So Ezekiel 37, it states, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he truly on the Spirit of the Lord to be upon you, even though he's in you, and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And, behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And sometimes we have to approach things with humility. Zechariah chapter 4 provides a great example of how Zechariah had an, had an encounter with an angel. And he saw these visions. And he would ask, for an explanation because he he wouldn't make assumptions about what he was seeing he would ask for an explanation of what he was seeing and then the angel would ex explain to him for example the, the lampstand and then explanation it kind of defied logic for example how do you come up with not by might nor by power but by my spirit says the Lord and for those who are what I'll call seers those who prophetic gifts are typically more dreams or visions and especially if the dreams and or visions are symbolic which will need the Lord to explain what those things mean for some people or at some times 
the dreams tend to be very literal. Whatever they see is what unfolds. Same thing with visions. But oftentimes, those things are symbolic. We also see it in Jeremiah 1, where Jeremiah had two visions. And those things were symbolic. For example, an almond tree that budded. And Lord said that he was watching over his words to complete them. It's like, how do you get that from an almond tree that budded? One of the things, there was a dispute in um, the camp with Moses. And he had them, the elders bring their rods. And the one that budded would show who the Lord was with. And it was Aaron's rod that budded. It was an almond rod. So there are a lot of things. But continuing. So again, do not make assumptions. And especially if you are a seer, where a lot of your revelations from the Lord come in the form of dreams and or visions. Some things he may give you an immediate understanding, but it doesn't hurt. It always helps to pray and ask the Lord, what does it mean? Even if you, you're pretty sure what it means, ask him what it means, what he wants to do with the information. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So he was commanding the prophet to prophesy unto the dry bones. And that's part of a lot of times we're missing. We're not waiting to do things. We're doing things based on our own strength. The Zechariah 4 things, I wasn't thinking about this initially, but the Lord said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Sometimes people are trying to do things by their might and by their power. And they say, I decree and declare, and it sounds powerful, but it's not by the Spirit of the Lord, and it falls flat. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring upon you flesh, or bring, upon, bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Revelation 19.10, there was an angel who told John that the testament of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. You can even say it the other way, the spirit of prophecy is a testament of Jesus. It's like whichever way you say it, it works out to be the same. A prophecy from the Lord points back to the Lord. And with a prophecy being true, it points to Jesus, whose name is faithful and true. He is the truth. Begin with verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And that's how amazing the word of the Lord is. A valley full of dry bones. Now they had no sinews, so these bones, they could have been scattered all over the place. And it said the bones came back to his bones. That's how specific the word of the Lord is. If the Lord only wanted, <laughs> if the Lord only wanted a portion of those bodies to be revived, that's all that would happen. I heard someone say recently that when Jesus went to Lazarus' tomb, he called Lazarus out. <laughs> and the person said that if Jesus said, come out, Everyone who was in the tomb would have come out. So he had to be specific and call Lazarus' name. So in this case, the bone to his bones. Because one time, or sometimes when people say, I decree and, de and declare, they're trying to put things together that never belonged together in the first place. And even if put, brought together, they will never truly fit together. It also ties into Daniel 2, when Daniel was interpreting the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And Daniel spoke about the feet of the statue being of iron and clay. And Daniel said that iron and clay do not truly cleave to each other. So even though they may look united, they do not truly cleave. And I continue. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them.
Back to verse 6, where it states, And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring, upon, bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. So initially, the prophet saw these bones coming back together and being covered with flesh, but there was no breath in them, no life. The Holy Spirit, the Ruach, the breath. So in a sense, he had not fully breathed on a prophecy to bring it to life. And sometimes when people are saying, I decree and declare, and they're <laughs> putting out that hot air, it's hot air, but it's missing the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy son of man and say to the wind <laughs> um back in march i saw kenneth copeland prophesying to um a certain virus i won't even call it his name and he was commanding it to die and at the same time commanding the vaccine be um, be made. And it's like, which is it? Are you commanding it to die or for vaccine? But that was hot air. And it says, oh yeah, he also called in like the east wind and stuff like that. And it still didn't work. So again, we have to be careful about I decree and declare. I even heard him say about him being a prophet of the Lord. I was like, what? So I was taken aback by that, but the word didn't come to pass, and I could tell when I heard it that it wasn't going to. <laughs> um, Thus saith the Lord God. And by the way, I smile with prophets can miss it. They can miss it for, or someone who's prophetic can miss it. They can give a word out of season, for example. Maybe they heard wrong, but there are some people. They have been missing it for so long and they keep on doing it that it's best that they just stop. But they refuse to give up. And it's actually sad. But sometimes like if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. So may as well laugh in order not to cry. Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. So again, he wasn't prophesying because he saw the dry bones or the bodies. He was, command, he was prophesying as the Lord commanded, commanded him. He was prophesying as the Lord commanded him. And they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. I was going to stop right here, but I'll go at least one more. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. I'll leave it right there. Ezekiel prophesied, but at the time he didn't know that the bones represented the house of Israel. It is possible for a prophet, because we know in part and we prophesy in part, it is possible for a prophet to prophesy something and not know the full extent of it. And the person may even state it, this is what the Lord told me, but I don't know the full extent. You can pray into whatsoever the case may be. It is possible for a prophet to prophesy something and may even come to pass, and a prophet doesn't know the full extent of it. Now, Jonah, when he prophesied about Nineveh, he set out a camp on the outskirts of town, and he was waiting to see the word come to pass. But in this case, Ezekiel didn't know what the word meant, and the Lord explained it. And it points to how we truly need communion fellowship with the Holy Spirit, to not make assumptions, to follow his command regarding timing and what we actually say, what we actually do. 
Another thing, this also speaks of restoration. And I, I know the Lord is speaking to someone why he's had me use the word restoration several times in this message when it would seem as if it shouldn't be a part of this message. But I know he's using me to minister to someone. And not just someone, but people regarding restoration. Like I mentioned with um, Joel 2.25 earlier about him restoring all the years the locust has eaten. Me speaking of um, him having me speak of Job 42 verse 10 about him restoring double unto Job. There's also that message within this message. And now for Ezekiel 37 verse 10. Our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. As long as you have the Lord, you have hope. If everyone else has forsaken you, as long as you have the Lord, you can say you plus God equals everything. You plus God equals everything. So with um, Ezekiel, he didn't just go to the Valley of Dry Bones. The Lord took him there. He didn't just start speaking to the bones. The Lord commanded him to. And when he was done, doing step by step what the Lord proclaimed unto him, the Lord told him the bones represented the house of Israel. You can ask the Lord, if you receive revelation, what does this mean? Some things he may not tell at the time. You have to wait and see. Now some messages are what you'd say is a thus say the Lord moment. Or you can say God said because he tells you something and what he tells you there's no need for interpretation you don't add or take away you simply say what the Lord said so this I decree and declare in Psalm 2 verse 7 it states I will declare the decree I will declare the decree and when you declare the decree the Lord makes a decree and you declare it he tells you, you proclaim it when he tells you to proclaim it. Because when you say something, the Lord is not obligated to do it. I'll give one example of when we know it wasn't the Lord who told someone to do something. The person did it and the Lord actually backed the person up. Now it would seem because um, 1 Samuel 3 verses... 19 through 20 tells us that the Lord was with Samuel and he didn't let any of his words fall to the ground. That is subject to interpretation. When it says about the Lord didn't let any of Samuel's words fall to the ground, was it that Samuel never said anything unless the Lord told him to say it? Or was it that if Samuel said something, the Lord would do it? That's a possibility, but it doesn't state it specifically. There was also a case. 2 Kings 6, if my memory serves. I think 2 Kings 4, where um, you verify before I say anything. In 2 Kings 4, Elisha, the Shunammite woman, had been very generous to him, and he wanted to find out what he could do for her. And he said to his servant Gehazi, Call her, starting verse 15 of 2 Kings 4. And when he called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, Thou shalt embrace a son. He didn't say, the Lord said, you will have a son. And we don't see anything about him praying and asking the Lord. He simply told her that by this time next year, you will have a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. <laughs> she knew as a man of God, but in that moment she was saying, do not lie unto her. Because as a man of God, he would not have lied unto her. 
a man for God or a woman for God is not a liar. And the woman conceived and bare a son that season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of life. We don't know if Elisha said it and the Lord backed him up. That's a possibility. But some people are making proclamations, declarations, as if they walk in that level of authority, as if they have that kind of relationship with the Lord, that he's going to do us what they say. May not be the case. But in Joshua's case, we know the Lord was with him in such a manner. Now, in Joshua verse 9, he had gotten into an ill-advised covenant with the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites had gotten in trouble, and they called upon Joshua. And picking up in Joshua 10, starting verse 7, So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly, and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel. So the Lord is truly with Joshua. And it wasn't Joshua fighting against the enemy. The Lord was fighting against them. And a part of this message for who it is for, the message within the message, is that with the Lord restoring things unto you, things that were stolen, things that were damaged, things that were killed, because a thief does come to steal, kill, and destroy. With the Lord restoring things unto you, for many of you, you have been fighting, you've been trying to get justice. You have been fighting in your own strength. And just like the Lord said in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. And a part of this is, rest in the Lord and know that he is fighting the battle for you. The Lord, he loves righteousness and he loves justice or judgment. And he will contend with those who are contending with you. So part of your task is to rest in the Lord. Trust him. Say, Lord, I am putting this in your hands for you to render justice for you to render justice, for you to fight on my behalf. Because he does defend the righteous. And it says, And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them, chased them along the way that goeth unto Beth Horon and smote them at Azekah and Makeda. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. So again, we have the Lord fighting the battle. And in this case, it wasn't that um, Joshua was calling down for hailstones. The Lord was raining down hailstones, taking out the enemy, because the Lord was fighting on their behalf. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. When it comes to your enemies, the Lord can do more to them than you ever could. Now, in some cases, your enemies will repent. And the Lord can make your enemies. He can make them your footstool. He can also make your enemies your friends. Now, some people, some entities, they're going to stick to their evil ways to the end. And if they want to do that, the Lord will make them pay. It is their choice. So again, there were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with a sword. Now the Lord may say the battle is his and not yours. It doesn't mean that you won't have any responsibilities. Maybe your responsibilities will be to pray. Or you may have what I call a mop-up role, 
where the Lord, well, this, <laughs> where the Lord, he does most of the damage, and then he'll have you go in, in a sense, clean up. We also see it in the Battle of Jericho. The Lord destroyed the walls of the city of Jericho. The people had a role regarding going around once per day for six days, and then seventh time on the seventh day, and seventh day, and then shouting, and the Lord tore down the walls. But the people still had to go into the city to fight. So you have to know the specifics when the Lord is telling you that he will fight the battle. He may do most of the, the heavy lifting and leave you to plunder. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And I pause there. The addition of the scripture was at the last minute as I was getting ready to record this presentation. Because the last thing I had was Ezekiel 37, 1 through 10. And even adding verse 11, that was a thing that was done in the spur of the moment on the unction of the Holy Spirit. And me adding Joshua 10, it is something when I was on the 40 day hiatus. Um, the Lord brought me to the scripture, and here it is coming up again. And one of the things during the time the Lord pointed out was when it said, The Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And I pause. Rather than just summarizing it, I will go there regarding something significant about the Amorites. And it goes all the way back to Moses. Correction now, Abraham. Starting in verse 13 of Genesis 15, when the Lord made a covenant with then Abram. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will judge, correction, will I judge. Exodus 1.12 tells us about the Israelites being in Egypt and the Egyptians were afflicting them. And it said the more they were persecuted or afflicted, the more they multiplied and grew. Under that pressure, harsh circumstances, the Israelites <laughs> Thriving may not be the exact or the right words, but they were, they were growing, they were multiplying, despite the circumstances. The Egyptians were the captors, the taskmasters. And some of you feel the same way, as if you're in bondage, bondage to the enemy, being persecuted, crushed on every side. And you may even feel as if the Lord is oblivious to what's going on. The children of Israel, they cried out to the Lord. Then he raised up a deliverer, Moses. In Exodus 3, the Lord told Moses that he heard the cry of the Israelites. The Lord hears your cries. And believe me. Actually, don't believe me. Believe the word of God. In due time, he's going to contend with those who are contending with you. So he knew they're going to be in slavery for 400 years. They're going to get afflicted. But it says, also, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And when the Lord judged them, oh boy, ten plagues. When the Pharaoh pursued, the army got wiped out. That was the Lord's judgment. Those who sow into the wind will reap the whirlwind. God is not mocked. He sees and he judges. So again, and also that nation whom they shall serve 
will I judge? And afterward, shall they come out with great substance? Job was afflicted, and he came out with the double. That is the Lord's character when he restores to restore double. So for those of you who are going through a season, oftentimes an extended season of being afflicted, know that when you come out, the Lord's going to ensure that you come out with substance. Oftentimes, the enemy's substance. But then again, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He doesn't even need the enemy's stuff to bless you. He has more than enough to bless you by himself. The blessing or the things from the enemy, that's to make the enemy pay. To make him regret that he ever put his hands against you. The word of God also tells us about Jesus. About if the prince of this world had known, he would have never crucified Jesus. Because in crucifying Jesus, he made it worse for himself. And now it is Jesus who has the keys to death and hell. The devil does have the keys to death and hell. Jesus does. And I'm going places I didn't think I'd go, but clearly the Lord has a message to communicate. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Abraham died when he was 175 years old. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. There are times when you're going through afflictions. And you're wondering, what's taking the Lord so long? Is it that he doesn't hear your cry? Do you need to fast and pray more? And sometimes like, no, no, no. What the Lord is waiting for? Either the enemy or those who will put themselves against you to repent or for their sins, their transgressions or iniquities to get to a certain point that he pours the cup of their iniquities back on their own heads. Sometimes it's just a matter of time or to reach a certain condition when things just mount up to the point that the Lord, it's almost like his only choice is to render judgment. Now the Lord always has choices, but it's like his only choice is to render judgment because things get to the level where it is truly enough. So for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. <laughs> and I go down a little bit. Um, in verse 18 states, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cabanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites, Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So all those Kenites, Perizzites, Hittites. But the one the Lord used as a trigger to set, to set the captives free, which is a part of what Jesus came here to do, he came to set the captives free. In Luke 4, 1 through 13, we see how the devil tried tempting Jesus. He had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. When the Lord went into the synagogue after the angels strengthened him, and he started his ministry, telling people to repent because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. When he went into the synagogue, he read from Isaiah 61. In Isaiah 61, it speaks about setting the captives free. That's what the Lord, and in fact, the Lord even said, today's scripture is fulfilled in your sight. He came to set the captives free. So if the Lord allows you to go through bondage from the enemy, know that he's going to deliver you. Know that he heard your cries. And sometimes it's not that you're not good enough. It's not that you're not perfect enough. It's not that you, don't, you haven't fasted and prayed enough. It's simply a matter of time. 
because he has a strategic reason for allowing what he's been allowing. But God sees, God judges, his righteous judges. So for all these Kabanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, etc., the one he spoke about were the Amorites. And going back to Joshua 10, we see how the Lord is pouring out his wrath on the Amorites. The Amorites. And Joshua was leading the generation who had been in bondage to the Egyptians. And they were now going into the promised land, the land that the Lord promised Abram, who was later renamed Abraham. The Lord headed in for the Amorites. Others too, but he specified the Amorites. And we see how they got pelted with large hailstones. So again, um, then spake Joshua to the children, or correction, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. So there are times the Lord will put your enemies in your hands. And he said in the sight of Israel, this is Joshua, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still. So Joshua spoke to the sun and the moon. He didn't say, thus said the Lord. He didn't pray and ask the Lord to make the sun and the moon stand still. He spoke to those things. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Now the Lord says that vengeance is his. He may cut you in a piece of the action. Whether he does or not, vengeance is his. One of the things why he says that vengeance is his, he doesn't want you to start entertaining evil in your heart regarding pouring out or doing evil to your enemies. He may allow certain things, but there are times when he may actually have you pray for your enemies. We see with Joshua 42, or question, um, Job 42, the Lord had um, Job pray for his friends. We even see it in um, Genesis 20, when Abimelech had taken Sarah into his harem within that year when the Lord promised that they would have the promised child, Isaac. The Lord told Abimelech, King Abimelech, he was good as a dead man if he didn't return Abraham's wife. And the reason why the Lord saved Abimelech was because Abraham prayed for him. So there are times when the Lord may have you dispatch with your enemies. And by that I don't mean kill, but dispatch with your enemies. But then there are times when he may actually have you pray for your enemies. Because if you don't pray for them, they're going to suffer immensely. I know some of you may be like, no, nah, I can't pray for them. But <laughs> the Lord may have you pray for your enemies. Or else it won't go well for them. So again, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. And a part of this, they weren't just the enemies of the Israelites. They were enemies of God, as we see back in Genesis 15, the Amorites. They were enemies of God. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. That ties into the restoration thing. We may be like, how can Lord restore some, something? When he said he will restore all the years, if the enemy, it, and again, there's usually a doubling effect. But there are things the Lord will do 30, 60, or 100 fold, or even more. He's not limited. The Lord caused an entire day to extend. There was also a case where, um, with King Hezekiah, the Lord sent Isaiah to prophesy to him to get his house in order because he was going to die. And a part of the test, or the sign, the sign to let him know that the prophecy was going to come to pass, was putting the sundial of Ahaz back 10 degrees. That meant reversing time. And then the Lord told him that he was going to add 15 years to his life. 
So the Lord is not limited regarding restoring the years the locust has eaten. And I'm saying this to you, but I'm also saying it to myself because I hear these words. So he will restore all the years the locust has eaten. He's not limited in that. And one of the ways he can do it is that you may have gone through hell, for example, 10 years. And he will just pour out blessings on top of blessings so much that it washes away those 10 years. And there are certain things that maybe would have taken 10 years to accomplish. And it may happen in a month. And you'll know that it was the hand of the Lord that did it. Restoring the years. Every single thing. And that is why it's absolutely asinine for the enemy to contend with a child of God. Because the Lord is going to judge the enemy. And the Lord is going to bless his children. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Another thing the Lord just brought up, as the Lord spoke about in um, Matthew 24, when he spoke about the great tribulation and about those days being shortened. The Lord can extend a day, he can shorten the day. And there are times in your life you've been like, it seems as if time is going by faster. It is. So in verse 14, and this is one of the key things with the scripture. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So the Lord actually did what Joshua proclaimed. The Lord actually did what Joshua declared. Joshua didn't declare it in the name of the Lord. But a part of the, the thing is, Joshua was doing something. It wasn't for selfish reasons. He was fighting for a victory for the Lord. And we can say the Holy Spirit moved them to make the proclamation. But in any event, he made that declaration and the Lord did it. And it says, there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Something the Lord just um, reminded me of. Sometimes you hear people saying that they're loosing angels. Maybe the Lord has given them that, uh, that authority. But we also have to um, look at the scriptures. Jesus didn't say that he could call for 12 legions or he could well call for 12 legions of angels. He said he could ask the Father to send 12 legions of angels. The Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, didn't say he would call upon the angels, but he would ask the Father to send he could send he could ask the Father to send 12 legions of angels. So people are saying, I decree and declare, but I can't find that in the scripture anywhere. But it does say about I declare the decree. In the Bible, kings would make a decree. They may say it, a scribe would write it, or, send, or they'd send a messenger. The king made the decree. And the subjects, the messengers, made the declaration. Some of you may be like, I'm still going to say I decree and declare. That's up to you. I just pointed out what the Bible says. The king makes the decree and we get to declare. I know it's going to minister to some people even more than I thought. In the first video that I did, speaking about if I'll return to our public ministry, I mentioned that I had more than 50 videos to record. And a part of going forward with ministry is to be more attentive to what the Lord wants me to do. The Lord gave me more than 50 videos to record. 
and rather than starting with number one and going through the list like that is what the Lord tells me to record and it doesn't mean though even I'm recording this today May 24th 2020 then I'm going to publish it within the next 24 hours that's not the case but it's simply the way the Lord wants me to record it the first message I recorded about if I'll return to public ministry that was actually message number 48 even though it had been brewing for so long but it was actually message 48 this is message number 11 and there are many more and this is only the second video I have recorded but a part of it is doing things in accordance with the Lord's will when we do things in accordance with the Lord's will He must back those things up but when we start doing things our own might and our own power you can say we may go ahead of the Holy Spirit and we don't want to do that one of the things with the Israelites when they're coming out of captivity they stay behind the angel of the Lord that pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night they stay behind let the Lord lead the way was it Micah 2 5 speaking about the breaker let him be the breaker who goes ahead of the way to clear it for you so that you're not doing things by might your might or your power but by you doing things by the Spirit of the Lord God bless you and Jesus is Lord